at Right for Variety. Thank you so much for showing up and for sticking around. Um, and uh, we thought it might be fun to talk a little bit about this movie with Chloe Grace Myers. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So, uh, just before we get into everything else, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, I'm sort of curious, what were you doing and kind of where were you when this film first came to you? And what really immediately stood out about it? Um, well, actually, prior to uh, reading this script, I had taken a hiatus in my career. So for the first time in uh, about 14 years, I, I took a year and a half break. Um, and I just wanted to kind of sit back and, and reconfigure who I was and what choices I was making and, and reconnect to the, to the reason I fell in love with acting in the first place. You know, five years old. Um, and when the script came across, my brother and I, who my brother Trevor and I work together, he's my manager and best friend and producing partner and, and everything. Um, he really connected to it for a multitude of reasons. Um, and when he gave it to me, I devoured it in about an hour, and it just it was the first project I think that really, I think, kicked me as an audience member into laughing and crying at the same time, which I feel like is really hard to do, especially with a movie about something that's so real um, and raw in America. Yeah. Was there any like particular scene or just aspect of the character that really jumped out and said, yes, this is right for me to play, and this is right for me to play coming back in from this hiatus? Uh, it was really just the, the torn on blondes <laughs> jumping on that table. I was like, oh yeah, for sure. I was like, I gotta take this one on. Uh, I can't pass that up. Um, no, but there was, there was a multitude. I mean, I think that I loved her, her empathy, which was really hard for me, I think, reading it. I, I was angry um, at, the, at the system, you know, at, at them putting these kids through this, at them thinking they're correct. But to see her respond in such an, an empathetic way and, and, and being able to, to speak to them and, and you know, with the, with the scene with John Gallagher Jr., um, when she could have just gone up and walked out of that room, but instead she stands up and puts her arm on his shoulder as he starts to sob. That was just such an interesting choice that I felt that that sentiment and that sense needed to be seen on screen. Um, because that's how you make progress in life, is not by looking at someone and going like double birds, even though you want to. Um, it's, it's being able to have that conversation and, and, and to understand where they're coming from, even if it's incorrect. So uh, the director you work with here, Desiree Akhavan, yeah. she, uh, this, is, yeah, this is her, <laughs> um, this is her sort of second feature, mm -hmm. and her first feature also dealt with issues of LGBT identity, yeah. uh, those in very, very different film, right. different sensibilities. Um, mm -hmm. What about that film or about talking to her convinced you, A, that she was the right director for this, mm -hmm. and also that she would help you craft this performance? Well, I think first and foremost, the fact that she she wrote with Cecilia, uh, her writing partner, they wrote this entire story. Uh, well, this, this script, they adapted it from the novel, which is an Emily Danforth novel, which is a beautiful novel. Uh, but the, the story of how, because the novel is a 500 page book um, that spans uh, a lengthy amount of Cameron's life. And this, this conversion therapy section is, is actually a very thin area in the story. And I, I found it very interesting, her reasoning as to why she wanted to go into that and, and show this. Um, and how she, in a lot of ways, when we first started talking about it, she referenced a lot of John Hughes films and how she wanted to make this um, easily accessible to all audiences. Because it's really a story, at its core, it's a story about being a teenager and being told that, like we all are as teenagers, uh, that you're, you're incorrect in the way that you feel, in the way that you are as, as who you are, that you, you need to conform to the system, you need to, to uh, hit a certain bar in class to be, you know, accepted by your peers, by your parents, and so on and so forth. Um, so the fact that she wanted to go in and and hit that, um, hit this movie on, on the head in that sense, I thought was very interesting. But also, I think the, the striking the tone of, of that comedy that verges on tears 
all at once and, and, and showing the hypocrisy without making a mockery of Christianity is who Desi is. She is able to, being that she is a bisexual Iranian American woman, she already has overcome so many obstacles in her life that she understands what it is like to be confronted with people being like, oh, you're naturally predisposed to being incorrect and that you don't need to be listened to. And so she somehow has found this way, this beautiful, eloquent way of, of making it path for herself and making her voice be heard, but also making you laugh at the same time. Um, and she's just a brilliant woman. And that was our, our, one of our first conversations was on Skype. And we just completely headed off. And then I went to New York and we met. And then within a week and a half, we were filming. Very quick. For no money. For like $850,000, 23 day shoot. And we shot in the camp that you see in the movie. We, we lived in that camp. So we were filming in each other's bedrooms, and our sets were literally like we had our own clothing to the left and right of the shot. So <laughs> there were moments when we'd be like, Ashley, you can't pan that way, because that's, that's my underwear. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny enough. How did that help you kind of get back into the swing of things, having taken that hiatus, yeah. uh, to kind of go back to a, such a bare bones kind of, kind of shoot as opposed to, say, a giant? Yeah, well, I mean, my, my projects prior to this was, it was The Fifth Wave, which we released, and then Neighbors 2, which we had released, which were both much above $35 million, uh, wide releases, um, and, and neither of which, that I, you know, I, I love both, but um, I just felt a little disconnected um, to myself, I guess I would say, uh, which I think in a lot of ways was also a fault of my own. I think I, I took... I took my own my own wants for granted, you know. In a lot of, I think you can do that kind of simply when you when you love working. I feel like you can kind of put yourself in a space where you work continually, but it, it's more important sometimes to hold yourself back and to be a bit more choosy with your own heart. Um, and that way, uh, you don't overextend yourself. Um, and so then going to this and. And it being quite a labor of love, uh, considering the work pace that we, we shot this at, um, it was just really nice. It was really beautiful. And it was, it was shot chronologically. So the relationships you see unfolding on screen, we had met, Sasha and Forrest and I had met 48 hours prior to our first day. So we literally <laughs> fell in love with each other as friends on screen. Um, and Desi took it and ran with it. And everything we did, like, we didn't have any proper shot, you know, set up, locked off shots. It was all just kind of like, you have one camera, throw it on Ashley's back, our amazing DP, and just go. And just be. Um, and I think it was just one of the, one of the most emotionally rewarding experiences of my career thus far. For sure. So, I mean, you just sort of mentioned, um, I mean, obviously this was a film that was directed by a woman, mm -hmm. written by two women, adapting a book by mm -hmm. a woman, mm -hmm. shot by a woman, edited by a woman. Yeah. Um, had you ever had, had, you ever had that experience before? And what, how was that experience different? Why did this movie, how did this movie benefit from having that well, multiplicity of women really calling the shots and everything? Right, um, well I would say that you know, I've worked, I've worked, like I said, for, for a long time now. I've made over something like 60 something films. And I've had a beautiful experience of working with a, a plethora of directors. It happens to be that 99% of them are, are men, but I, I made a kind of cognizant choice um, off the, that year and a half break to try and make sure that I work with more female filmmakers, make sure that I work with more female you know, writers and, 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 and DPs and just trying to be cognizant in kind of making a choice in that direction. Um, and, and I would say that this movie, I couldn't imagine it being handled in any other way. Not just that it is a female who directed it and wrote it, a female who shot it, but that it's a, a queer woman who directed it. And a story like this, I think to have that perspective is the only way you, you end up with that tone. Um, which 
is singular to Desiree, uh, and I, I commend her for that. But I think for me as an actor, what it was like on the set, I would say it, it, the easiest way I can convey how it felt was through the sex scenes. And I would say that these are, in my opinion, some of the most beautiful and delicate sex scenes, and they truly progress the character. Without the sex scenes you have in this movie, without them, you wouldn't understand how real her relationship with Coley was. You wouldn't understand uh, Emily Skegg's character, that, that, that tension in that scene and that torment that she feels after and how she wouldn't even allow Cameron to kiss her after that. Um, it showed such a level uh, that, that I think puts you in a place as an audience where you, you can really grasp what's happening. And none of it was shot, you know, it, it's not this stark reality of like, oh, what is sex? It's, it's, it's obviously just a different sentiment and a different perspective. Um, and as an actor, it felt, it felt really nice because also I wasn't told what, you know, what we had to get accomplished in the scene. Which prior to this, every sex scene I've had in the movie, we've literally sat down with a plethora of humans telling me exactly what shots we needed, how we needed me to look, what faces I needed to make. Like it was very clinical, very clinical. And I was like, okay, <laughs> got it. Um, <laughs> for sure. I'll oh, be sure to do that one. Uh, <laughs> but in this, Desi, she literally was like, I think you got this. <laughs> And I'm not going to tell you what to do. And she made everyone disappear. And that scene in the car, she literally made everyone hide. <laughs> and people were hiding in different areas. And she was like, don't go near that car. <laughs> and she was literally, it was Ashley and me and Quinn. And that was it. And it just it was two takes. That was it. And that's all you need. Because it's like, it's not rocket science, guys. Sure, sure. Oh, that's about <laughs> Um, speaking about having that perspective, I mean, I know you met with people who had gone through mm -hmm. conversion therapy before. What, kind of, well, two questions. One, what surprised you about their stories or about with meeting them? And then what tangible element did you take from those meetings and put into your character? I was, I was so, I mean, my, my biggest shock in meeting the, the people that I met is, was the modernity of the issue. Um, I met five people that had been through conversion therapy right before we went upstate to film the movie. Um, and they were all no older than 24, 25 years old. Uh, they'd been put in at 15 or so years old. They had gotten out maybe two years prior to us talking. So that, being that I'm, I'm 21 now, I was 19, almost 20 when I made the movie, um, I, I was I so... Was so severely taken aback. Um, and my my questions, I, I guess all of it really changed for me in that moment because I realized that this wasn't just an issue that I felt was an interesting issue, it was a pertinent real issue that we needed to be talking about, that we needed to be um, showing on film. And then when I got into the statistics of it, I was shocked to hear that 700,000 people in America had gone through it. That the stats were that 77,000 teenagers in the next five years will be put through it. Um, that it's only illegal for minors in 14 states, but it's legal to be practiced in all states in America. Um, and that it's not just in, in the South, it's not just in a conservative state, it's, it's in Manhattan. Um, the place where it's growing the most is in Manhattan. Um, and that for me, it just changed my entire perspective, I guess, to really taking this movie on in making sure that I, I struck the right, well, I, I did, I showed the reality of it. Um, and that this wasn't just interesting, but it was in a lot of way, a form of activism uh, and being able to teach people what this is without making them feel like they're taking their medication and, and, and making it an entertaining experience. But now, you know, you'll end up Googling it and, and, and understanding what it is, which is a nice, nice thing to be able to do. Um, you know, one of the things I've loved about your performance here is how often uh, Cameron's only line will be like, okay, or yeah. I mean, you must say okay 
period so many times. So many times. So there's this this multiplicity of different meanings. Here. So how do you... How many, how many ways can you say okay? Exactly, exactly. So I'm just curious, what is the process like to do a character that, that can be so internal and so withdrawn without losing the character, without becoming monotone? Like, like how do you sculpt a scene where it's like, okay, your line is okay? Well, how do you know what to strip down and when it's too much? I think a big part of that and, and the way it came across in this movie, I think a big testament of that is is to Desiree and to mm. Ashley Connor, our DP, because they, Desi realized very quickly that I, I can just, I, I, I like to just kind of sit there in a moment and, and walk through it in my mind. And, and that's just something that I, I like to do as a character. And when she realized that, she wasn't afraid to, which is a very bold choice as a director, I feel, to just linger on characters. And she does it with John Gallagher Jr., with the serial, which is like, I think, my favorite scene in the movie. <laughs> so heartbreaking. I'm like, oh, God. Never seen someone eat Cheerios so sadly. Um, <laughs> brutal. Oh, I have. So not a Cheerios ad. Not an ad for Cheerios. Um, <laughs> oh, I have. <laughs> Oh God, I'm so sorry. Oh God, your breakfast love, must be so bad. sad. Yeah, a lot of bad breakfast memories. God, oh. um, no, but but she she made a really bold choice as a director to linger, and Ashley was never afraid to move closer, to inch closer to you, and to not you know there was never a, a real cut in a lot of the scenes. We would just sit there, um, and that was something that. Is, is a sort of dance and a, and a beautiful choreography that only comes from from that silent communication. So so the you know the scenes, the the writing I think in this movie is absolutely beautiful and so eloquent and it's we didn't have to improv anything because it was brilliantly written honestly. Um, and so the moments where you do see that silence, those were moments, those were directorial choices and decisions on Desiree's part and. It was just a, a set and a, an atmosphere that you could sit in your character because you felt safe and you felt comfortable and it was a lot to walk through the, those emotions, but how can you have the questions that were being thrown at me in those scenes? I couldn't not think, <laughs> you know? it's That iceberg scene is a moment where I think I say like three different things, maybe four lines in that scene, but it's the magnitude of someone confronting you like that is jarring with so much conviction. They're, they're confronting you with so much conviction. And I think I was just taken aback by hearing the lines said so directly, because we didn't rehearse the scene, really. We just shot them. And so hearing them for the first time, I was like, oh, Jesus. Oh, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, well. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Was that the hardest scene to get right, or? What was? That was a very difficult scene to get right. I would say, all of this, I mean, there wasn't a scene in this movie, I couldn't over, I couldn't really start to think about the scenes that we were shooting until we shot them, because I, I, I started off the movie thinking about them a lot, and like really trying to walk through them, and I was like, I shouldn't be doing this, because I find this now incredibly daunting, and I don't think I can achieve this tomorrow. Um, and so I would find myself just, kind of just being like, let's just, oh, let's just shoot it, like, let's just keep going, and we didn't have much time anyway, so we just kind of just did these scenes, and that, for me, I think was the only way we were able to to get through what we were getting through because there wasn't one scene in the movie that is that is an easy scene. I would say maybe the easiest scene, honestly, is crying under the desk because I knew what I had to do in that, which was cry. I was like, I know this is a moment where I gotta like get there, and like that's my easiest thing to deliver. But like the moments with the iceberg, or I think, oh, the hardest scene actually. The hardest scene is when I read the Coley letter and I go to my friends and I choose, I choose to give into the system and I choose to try and pray to Gay and I choose to try and, and and cleanse myself of this sin. I think that was my hardest scene because I was just so just against what my character was saying in that moment and I was like, geez, it's it was heartbreaking to give in to the conditioning and be like, oh wow. That was my hardest thing because those were also the true sentiments of what all the, the survivors said to me. It was unanimous across the board that they all 
were their own worst enemies in the beginning, being that they pushed themselves the hardest to get clean. They all had that moment where they decided to want to take it. And now, yeah. wow, that's, that's a lot. So this movie uh, debuted at Sundance, won the jury prize. Yeah. Which yeah. The little, little train that could. There you go. <laughs> the little movie that can. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so you know, you've, you've done a couple festivals. You did yeah. Tribeca, right? I think. Yeah, yeah we did Tribeca. Um, and obviously, it came out um, a month or so ago. What has been kind of the most surprising response you've gotten from from all these kind of different stages of release? Um, I would say that it's. I mean, nine times out of ten, people that have seen the movie that I've talked to about the movie, I guess I'm I'm just still taken aback about how there's so many people affected by it, and it, like like as in not not affected by just watching the movie, but that they know people who have personally gone through a form of conversion therapy. That's always shocking to me. And that, I think, is just, it, it continues to become more and more people. And the more we do screenings, and the more we do Q&As, especially, you know, big, big audience Q&As and just random ones in different cities, there's more and more people that go like, oh, you know, actually my cousin's best friend's sister mm-hmm. went and was put into conversion therapy when she was 17. And you're like, oh, what? Um, and it was actually, I guess, to make it personal and to share my own side of the story, is my, my, I have two gay brothers in my family. We come from a very religious upbringing, Christian Baptist uh, in Georgia. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and they actually opened up to me um, after they saw the movie, which they had never said this to me. I was so shocked by it. it. Was that in Los Angeles when we moved here? We moved here when I was I was young, um, but they came out when I was eleven. They had gone to our church, and they had talked to our minister, and they had gone through counseling within our church to try and pray the gay away. And I, I mean, you know, we're you know we're we were a conservative family. My parents were conservative, but my mother was always very open. My mother was always very accepting. And just to hear that that struggle was within my own family, I, I, I remember breaking down when they told me, because I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't know that. And I didn't know that it, it had touched my family in that way to that extent. Um, and that just broke my heart. But it, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's really well. So we only have a couple minutes, but if anyone has a couple really... Good question. Yes. Let's see it in the back. Put blinders on like a horse. Yes. I, uh, you know what? Uh, in frame all the time were Eric and his sister with icebergs. Uh, but they weren't addressed. Uh, and since uh, uh, Cameron had a chance to look at everybody else's icebergs, I'm wondering, since you've had the time perhaps, what did Cameron and yourself maybe see on Eric's and his sister's icebergs? Because that I find actually is the more interesting. Hmm. Oh. I need to phone a friend. <laughs> I need to phone Emily Danforth, who wrote the novel. Um, you can take this as like a workshop. Yeah, well, you know what? Let's, let's workshop this. Um, <laughs> well, I'll say a word, and then you tell me what you think when I say it. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, you know, I, I, I do remember uh, sitting down, and, and they, they did print out all the, all the different icebergs, and and there were, each actor was, was asked what they would kind of want on their icebergs. There was only obviously the icebergs that we had to get correct were the ones that were written into the script with exact dialogue, um, which we talked through. Uh, but, you know, I guess the closest I can get to answering this, sorry, uh, I'll try my best, is that each actor had a, a their own fingerprint on what their iceberg would say. Um, which is an interesting thing to do, and I think it talks about, I think it, it speaks to how organic um, and how open, open-handed open the, the direction of this movie was in the sense that she allowed us to really create our own characters um, and, and have a hand in, in, in who they are. Um, but I don't know, oh my lord. I'm really trying to give you a better answer here. Do you want me to converse with you or just move on? <laughs> I mean, do you have another question? Well, no, no, no. I just, you, you 
Thank you. Uh, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, ma'am? Yes. Very amazing performance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, is this going into wide release? I mean, has there been any sort of pushback about where uh, has there been pushback where it needed? Uh, well, so we, we made this movie independently, obviously. Um, we took it to Sundance. We ended up winning the grand jury prize. And, and to give a little bit of backstory, the, the way the grand jury prize works is usually you win and within 24 hours you're sold to like a major, major company and you're released and you get a very wide release and hopefully it usually ends up being an award push is how it's gone in the past. With our movie, we sold and it still took us uh, almost a month and a half to we, we we won and it took us a month and a half to sell we sold to a company that trusted in us and that wanted to fight for us but every single big company said that we were unmarketable wow. oh yeah uh and i was just i was really taken aback by that because those two things don't go hand in hand um they had never gone hand in hand in the past and for them to look at this movie and say that that it was impossible for this to be marketed to uh, main audiences, mainstream audiences, that, that really shocked me. Um, so we've had a, we had a tough, uh, a tough beginning and we had a very, very small release in, in New York and LA in arc light theaters. <laughs> so that's like small, small area, but, um, we, we have had a bit of a platform release. So we are, we were, are re-releasing on November 6th, um, a little bit wider. A little few more cities, I think Chicago, Atlanta. Um, but it's really just been difficult to to prove to people, and I guess the higher ups that really work in just money and stats, that there is a need and a want for this movie. And what's cool is that even though we had such a small opening, our ticket sales, when you compare them to the the movies that opened the same weekend as us, uh, much wider. Our ticket sales were were 10 times of theirs. They, we had genuine numbers that people went out to these very few theaters, that they went and they bought tickets to every single screening and they were packed screenings, each one of them. Uh, here, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And it just shows that there is a space, but you know, and, and this is why I always think the audience is because Buying a ticket nowadays to a movie like this is casting a ballot. It's casting a ballot and it's showing those that are higher up that these movies do want to be seen, that these movies deserve to be made, um, and that these aren't the little trains that could. These are the ones that are, are are wanting to be seen more than those that are being, you know, made for two hundred million dollars. Um, so yeah, thank you for just seeing the movie and, and and talk about it because our future is up to audiences as is our midterm election. <laughs> 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 Thank you guys so much.